Performing a phacoemulsification in a small pupil comes with its own level of challenges. Largely the propensity of damaging the intraocular structures like the pupil, the rex's edge and the compromise on visibility is significant in these cases. Moreover, when we do consider using a pupillary dilating device, the resultant mechanical stretch can result in some amount of sphincter damage. And sometimes you may be left with a pupil that doesn't eventually get back down to its normal size. In the following video, I'd like to demonstrate the technique of a safe phacoemulsification for a patient who presented with a grade 2 nucleosclerosis and a pupil of 4 to 5 millimeters. And I'd like to share with you the various principles of managing a small pupil phaco without the use of any dilating device. Let's move to watching the video. Now, since we do know that we are going to be dealing with certain challenges because of the small pupil, it's very important that the initial steps, that is your incision, your rexis and hydro, should be flawless. For example, you don't want an incision that is too narrow that could result in difficulty in negotiating instruments with an increased chance of damaging the iris. Neither do you want an incision that is too large which could allow iris to prolapse out. We need to ensure that at all steps throughout the surgery, we do not accidentally damage the pupillary edge. After staining the anterior capsule suitably and then washing it out under viscoelastic, I now proceed to perform the capsular excess. It's extremely important to maintain the capsular excess just within the pupillary edge. One, you then have visibility of the rex's edge throughout the surgery. You ensure you don't damage it and more so all the fluid that goes in and out of the bag comes right out within the rex's edge. There's no unnecessary ruffling of the pupillary edge, thereby negating any further reduction of the pupillary size. Another important point to note is that the hydrodissection procedure becomes fairly blind. You cannot really see the wave go up to the equator and behind it. So you look for the visible wave in the visible part of the nucleus within the pupillary edge as well as you look for a nuclear rise. And finally, you rotate the lens to confirm the completion of the hydrodissection. Let's now move to understanding the various considerations in the nucleus management of a small pupil phaco. Now let's come to the phaco settings. We need a phaco power which is proportional to the density of the cataract. Now that phaco power doesn't change whether your pupil size is small or large. It is dictated by the density of the cataract. We now come to the flow rate. We reduce the flow rate significantly in these cases and that's because we want a little more control in managing these cases with small pupils. The vacuum is only slightly reduced and this is how I decide my power modulation in these cases. To me, the best technique for nucleus emulsification is the direct chop technique. In a small pupil phaco, since you need to work within the central 3 to 4 millimeters which is the only visible area here, no other technique would work as well as a direct chop. Let's watch the direct chop demonstrated here. It's very important to ensure that your instruments remain visible throughout the surgery. That is, the phaco tip in the chopper should always remain within the pupillary margin. After creating the first chop, I rotate the nucleus and try and break down this nucleus into two heminuclei. I then proceed to now chop this heminucleus into smaller emulsifiable fragments. That has been demonstrated here. Please note how at all times my instruments are well within my line of sight. I'm ensuring that there's no accident damage by the phaco tip or the chopper to either the rex's edge or the pupillary margin. The entire nucleus is similarly downsized 
into multiple emulsifiable fragments. Having achieved this, I perform a viscofluid exchange. I now replace the chopper for a dialer and each fragment is now brought up into the pupillary plane and emulsified. I try and ensure that throughout the surgery, my phaco tip remains close to the center of the eye. Please note that the emulsification of the individual fragments takes place in the pupillary zone. I rotate each fragment and bring it to come to lie opposite the phaco tip prior to its subsequent emulsification. And as you can see here, if some of the fragments are slightly larger, it can be downsized on its way up and then emulsified. I now proceed to emulsify the last fragment. Now this brings us to the end of the emulsification of the nucleus. The points to take into consideration while performing the irrigation aspiration are 1. You again have limited visibility. So I prefer a bimanual irrigation aspiration because it's very easy to remove the cortex circumferentially. Another advantage of the bimanual irrigation aspiration is that sometimes you can use either the irrigation or the aspiration cannula to move the iris away to aid your visibility in looking for any residual cortex which may not have been removed. I now proceed to implanting the intraocular lens and I think the only important point while implanting the lens is to ensure because of the limited visibility again that the IOL completely goes within the capsular bag. You need to ensure that none of the haptics accidentally slips into the sulcus. Please do note how both the haptics are stuck to each other. This sometimes happens in a hydrophobic lens. It's very important to ensure that both haptics get unstuck prior to ending the case because if you left it like that, sometimes you might end up seeing a haptic in the anterior chamber or in the sulcus the next day. So I ensure that both haptics get unstuck. I ensure both of them find their place within the capsular bag and then I proceed with performing a stromal hydration. And this brings us to the end of this surgery. Thank you and I hope it was a useful learning.